Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, or oh, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Awasar, Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the Africa, the African Studies Center at Michigan State University. Welcome everybody to another Eye on Africa. For those of you who don't know, Eye on Africa is a weekly speaker series that, that the African Studies Center at MSU organizes every semester. So every Thursday we, all, uh, we invite scholars to come share uh, their research with, with us. And because of COVID-19, we're going virtually uh, this semester. Uh, I'm shortly going to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Kwesi Ampine. But before I do that, let me let everybody know that there will be a question and answer session uh, at the end of the talk. So please write your questions uh, using the Q&A section. So one other information. So this, this, this session is being recorded and it's gonna be available uh, probably some days later on our website. And you can view all of our previous uh, recordings. It's available on our YouTube channel. If you go to the African Studies website at MSU, you can find them. So now a brief introduction of Dr. Uh, Ampene. Uh, Dr. Kwesi Ampene is an associate professor of ethnomusicology at the University of Michigan. He specializes in the rich musical traditions of the Akan people of West Africa. He has disseminated his research in conferences and speaking engagements at major universities in the United States and around the world. He has also provided expert advice for public engagement projects on Ashante and Akan culture and music to the British Library, Taft University and Princeton University. His latest book, Ashante Court Music and Verbal Arts in Ghana, The Porcupine and the Gold Stool, was published on June 30th, 2020 by Routledge Press. Additional book publications include Engaging Modernity, Ashante in the 21st Century. So that book was published in 2016. Uh, Discourses in African Musicology, that one came out in 2015. And Female Song Tradition and the Akan of Ghana, the Creative Process in Nuwongkoro. Uh, that book appeared in 2005. He is the producer of the film documentary, Gone to the Village. Uh, Dr. Ampene is a member of the editorial board of the SOAS Studies in Music Series at the University of London and the outgoing chair of the African Music Section in the Society for Ethnomusicology. Thank you very much, Dr. Ampene, for being here and welcome. We are very delighted to have you. So I turn it to, to you now. I think you're muted. Thank you. So um, uh, bear with me as I go into the system and share my slide with you. Um, let me go back again. Um, share. Okay. So, um, thank you, uh, Awa, for uh, your kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to go through a, a brief uh, thank yous and then we can start. Uh, I'm profoundly grateful to uh, Dr. Jamie Monson, the director of the African Studies Center, and Awa as the assistant director for inviting me to share my research with you this afternoon. I'm also thankful to my colleague, Dr. Paul Shawet, for also uh, nominating me uh, for this talk. And um, lastly, Nicole and the entire staff 
uh, who have been so uh, who are so amazing and gracious with their time as they worked in their trenches with me to make it possible for me to deliver my lecture by way of this complicated virtual mode. For the attendees, I'm also thankful to you all for leaving your busy schedule and joining us this afternoon. I look forward to your comments and critiques after my presentation. On the continent of Africa, the Asante are located in present-day Ghana. And on the map of Ghana, the Asante is now one of the 16 administrative regions located approximately uh, in the central for forest area, um, colored gold in this Ghana map. The Asante are also part of several Akan states in present-day Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire. And uh, on this map, uh, the area is colored gray. Um, so if I mention the Akan, then I'm referring to this homogeneous group. Okay, so thank you now. Um, I guess uh, I'm, uh, we are ready for my paper then. In contested formal spaces involving court ceremonies, and rituals, how do you navigate a complex web of account interactional routines and communication protocols to directly articulate the collective anxieties of the masses to the king following the death and burial of the Asante Hima? I address the above question and additional questions that may arise by examining the performed petition presented to the Asante Hine, Otunfo said to the second, by members of the Kete Chorus. I argue that in matrilineal societies, the fundamental role of women in lineage, kinship, and governance to the continuity of the matriline and the state. Further, in their privileged position as members of the exclusive Kete Chorus, they used their artistic immunity to negotiate uh, communication strategies in formal spaces in order to present contrapuntal voices of the masses directly to the Asantehine. As a form of political dialogue that indexes diverse registers of concerns, they implored the Asantehine through songs to choose the most qualified member of the Oyoko matrilineage to succeed the late Asante Hima. I will begin with the events leading up to the performed petition, the role of women in lineage, kinship, and governance, and touch on interactional routines in formal settings. Following that, I will highlight the first song unit performed by the Kitty Chorus for analysis and conclude with a brief discussion of gesture and rhetoric. On November 14, 2016, the most powerful woman in the Asante Kingdom, the Asante Hema Nana Afia Kobi Sewa Ampim II, passed on to eternity. As we say in Asante, she went to the village. She was 111 years old and reigned for 39 years. Her life spanned three generations, and she served as Antimine and Ghana for a generation. The Asante, like all their Akan cousins in Ghana and the Ivory Coast, practiced the dual male-female system of governance to ensure complementarity, equilibrium, and harmony. The male chief, Ohine, and his female counterpart, Ohima, have separate calls with functionaries and corresponding regalia. Although the Asante Hine is the occupant of the gold stool, Sikadria Kofi, the most potent symbol and spiritual essence of Asante identity, he together with the Asante Hema are both custodians of this revered object. 
the Asante Hima assumes total custody of the ghost too when it becomes vacant through the death or if a reigning king is distilled for acting contrary to his oath of office. In either situation, it is the Asante Hima's duty to nominate a successor from her matrilineal. The dual leadership role has its functional equivalence in the organization of musical ensembles, such as the male and female atumpan drums. When two are used, the huge pair of boma drums are similarly designated as male and female drums. The dual male-female leadership role is possible since Akan societies are fundamentally based on a matrilineal system where one's lineage, inheritance, succession to political office, land ownership, and property is validated through the maternal line or the bloodline. All the seven or eight Abusian or clans trace their founding to a female ancestress and thus making the position of Asante Hima critical with numerous responsibilities. She presides over her own court and oversees issues affecting women in the kingdom. Then symbolically, she is the mother of the Asante Hime, but occasionally she can be the biological mother as well, as it was the case of the late Asante Hima, who was the mother of the reigning king. As the symbolic or biological mother of both, she counsels the Asante Hime. She cautions him, her warnings to him are taken seriously, and she advises him as the Asante, the Asante will say in times of crisis, could see free wabre waho, go and consult your old lady. The Asante Hima together with the widows of past Asante Hine and a select group of Ahima from some localities in the kingdom constitute the Ketekoros. Unlike community-based popular oh, no. bands like Adwa or Nyongkro groups, membership in the Ketekoros is exclusive and restricted to the named individuals above. Most people associate Kete with Brahmin and dancing, but Kobran Ketia informs us that the Asante Hine's Grand Kete Orchestra is made up of an all-male cast of drummers and percussionists, a female chorus, and in the old days, a group of men who played long vertical pipes. Koresi, you're not seeing your slides. Did you put them on and it was... You're not seeing the slides? No, 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 they're not, they're not, it's not showing. Can you say that again? We're not seeing the slides, the slides. Can yeah. you see, can you see yeah. now? Yes, oh, yes. Okay, so I have blank portions. There oh, are por okay. Yeah, okay. there are portions. So, so for instance, after this one, there will be a blank slide. That's fine. Okay, that's good to know. And it was a little bit blurry. Okay. I don't know what happened. Just wanted to... Can you say that again? The, the previous slides were a little bit blurry, but this one is fine. We're seeing it very well. Thank you. And sorry to interrupt. Yes, oh, it's well. okay. It's Thank okay. So, well. yeah, it's okay. So I have the blank slide so that we can concentrate on the reading. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So where are, what was I? All right. Okay. Okay. Katie Drums are covered with red and black checkered cloth to signify crisis, matters of grave uh, consequences and grief. Kete is performed all night after the burial of a member of the royal family, during festivals, remembrance rites, at their ceremonies, and crucially in times of cli uh, crisis. So then I go into the blank mode over there. If the passing of Nana Efiakobi her funeral rites and burial brought grief and trauma to Asantiman. The aftermath of her burial on January 19, 2017, and the anticipation of a new Asante Hima ushered in a period of anxiety unprecedented in recent years. The apprehension of the people is due in large part to the unique historical precedent. It has been over two centuries since a reigning Asante Hima ruled with her biological mother. It has also been
his biological mother, uh, Nana Kunadu Yadom, the fourth Asante Hima. The selection of a successor to fill a vacant Asante Hima stool falls on the Asante Hima who appoints a female member from the Oyoko Matri line in Kumase. But that did not prevent the gossip machine from being activated. When is he going to make an announcement? Who will be the successor? What will be the age of the appointee? Will he appoint a relatively younger successor or will old age and seniority be a factor in his decision? In these days of real time information, thanks to the internet, social media platforms circulated all kinds of stories about the potential successor. They even went as far as circulating a picture of a woman who in their calculations had already been appointed by the Asante Hime. Concerned citizens didn't have to wait long to channel the apprehension to the Asante Hime. Wednesday, January 25th, 2017, six days after the burial rise happened to be Akudaye on the Akan calendar. Compared with Akwesidae that celebrates life, Akudaye provides the space for somber reflections about death and thus resulting in comparatively uh, solemn celebration. Following tradition, the Asante Hine Otun Fosei II is formally seated on a raised dais in the inner court of Manchia Palace. His elders, chiefs from Kumasi Traditional Council and a handful of territorial chiefs of Asantiman have taken their respective positions around him. There is a single uh, royal spokesperson staff, Achiame Poma, adjacent to the raised dais. Two chronicle singers, Kwajum Four, and two players of short ivory trumpet, Mentia Four, are in their usual positions behind him. Conspicuously missing from the Ukudai ceremony is the usual cadre of sound producing and musical instruments visual symbols of power, such as swords, shells, and royal regalia. The atmosphere remains solemn since participants are still recovering from the four-day momentous burial rites. Interactional routines in greetings. Following socially bounded protocols associated with interactional routines and communications in formal settings, participants enter the royal space, proceed towards the Asante Hine, and begin formal greetings that are layered with non-verbal symbolic gestures. The men remove their sandals or shoes and bow when they are close to uh, uh, the king. As a sign of reverence, the men lower their clothes from the shoulder to at least the elbow. All of a sudden, a group of women appeared in the royal space and proceeded to, uh, the, uh, to the raised dais, and one by one, they took a bow. Instead of finding a place to sit, they gathered at the end of the royal space and before they could all take a bow, one of them called for attention with a spoken word, Ago, followed by a series of sonic actions in a performance initially involving four songs. As if on cue, all signs of fatigue vanished a few lines through the first song as all participants seemed to be uh, all participants seem to be energized by the message and the performance, and in the end, responded with hand claps. The message is loud and clear. Far from the commonplace labeling of such performances as praise singing in anthropology and ethnomusicology, we have just witnessed a group of women sourcing out the medium of musical performance to present a petition. This understanding questions our general reference to such performances as a form of praise. For instance, in her ethnography of Ojura at Akropona Kriapun, another Akan state, Michelle Gilbert describes dancing women who call out the king's praises. Writing on the Buganda Kingdom in Uganda, ethnomusicologist Peter Cook references 74 praise dramas who perform as part of a coronation ritual. The performed petition is timely and a powerful intervention by the female members of the matric clan for the Asante he need to consider the views of the masses as he contemplates on his choice 
for the vacants too. Implied in the petition is the potential threat that the wrong choice of an incapable successor will potentially unleash, unleash chaos and violence in Asante. At the end of the fourth song, the Asante Hine expressed his gratitude by shaking the hands of each member of the chorus. But before leaving the scene, Nana Tutua, the lead singer, began another song to round off the performance. With another applause from the participants at the end of the last song, they took a collective bow and returned to the Asante uh, Palace. Now I'm going to go in and share um, the video uh, clip for you of the performance uh, with you. So. Yeah, um, I would like you to pay attention to the beginning when the women came in and they were taking a bow in front of the Asante and seated up here. And then at the end of the performance, I will now taking a bow, the, the Asante invited them and shook each person's hand. There's a reason for, for us to compare these two uh, interactional routines. Before the songs, uh, it, it was just taking a bow. There were, there were no handshakes. And then after the song, it, it handshakes. Um, so pay attention to that. All right, so here. <laughs> Sasa 
So you can see a few of them come and then I'll post it in the interest of time. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to go on uh, in the interest of time. So let me. Uh, stop it here and then share my slide get back to my slide um okay so i'm back to my slide and it's a blank slide um so don't be alarmed um interactional routines and artistic immunity in his pragmatics of account greetings kofi ajikun describes account greetings as interactional routines that attain a level of performance during formal events in the palace. The high status person, says Ajekun, is seated on a dais and remains motionless as the less powerful initiate the greeting by moving towards him or her. Depending on the situation, greetings may We're not hearing you, Kwesi. Hand size and stretches further down to about 30 feet and thus creating what are referred to as the royal space. Depending on the type of cer ceremony, the royal space can potentially stretch on for over 200 years.
guided by socially bounded protocols, it is within the royal space that a complex web of international routines and com communication protocols take place. <laughs> Identifies the Achame and Achame in English are uh, the royal spokespersons, strategy of mediation where all forms of communications are uh, routed to them for onwards transmission to the Asante head as part of distancing mechanisms. I refer to this system of international routine as triadic communication. Once in the royal space, an individual or a group faces the Achiame who sit adjacent to the Asante head and narrate the message. The message is taken on by the Achiame and, on, on, and ornamented with proverbs and other rhetorical devices and safely delivered to the Asantehne. A response from the Asantehne is filtered through similar procedures of speech to the guests. In ad addition to the above, I will include the use of sword bearers of Nasuafo, surrogate verses of the variety of ivory trumpets, Asokwafo, signal grounds in Pebi, Ninkraiwe, and Nkukwage, court criers, um, Essen, and other court functionaries as part of a complex strategy of mediation and royal distancing. In a, a, typical, a typical example here, uh, you have the guests up here uh, facing the Achiami who are sitting here and narrating their message, and then the king is sitting on this far end here. So it goes from the guest to the Achiami, from the Achiami to the king, and from the king to the Achiami and back to the guest in what I refer to as triadic uh, form of communication. How did Nana Tutua and members of the Kete Chorus negotiate a complex web of formal communication protocols, including mediation and distancing mechanisms to directly articulate the collective anxieties of the masses to the Asante in her framing essay, Power and the Play of Music, in the multi-authored volume, Music and the Play of Power in the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia, Laudan Nushin's questions along similar lines are instructive and worth reflecting. You muted, Koisi. We lost you for a second. Yeah, me too. I, I, uh, I'm glad that we are back. Yes. Wow. Okay. Um, so where was I? Um, okay. What is it about music that creates the space for agency and empowerment? What is it about music that facilitates and sometimes disrupts the exercise and flow of power? In other words, why didn't members of the chorus face the Achiami to perform the petition for onward transmission to the Asantehne? Instead, they were able to. Okay, so um, hopefully, um, um, I hope you can bear with us. I think this is part of the presentation. <laughs> the, the on and the off is maybe part of it. So this is the second time. Hopefully, it will be, the network will be stable. Okay. Two lines of answers come to mind when I reflect on the above questions. As I indicated in my opening paragraph, in a matrilineal society, the fundamental role of women in lineage, kinship, and governance confers power and latitude to women, more so when they belong to the exclusive chorus with the Asante Hima. 
Um, okay. Uh, I'm sorry here. Let me go back and share my slide. Um, he took my slide away. Okay. So um, the Asante Hima is part, uh, you know, you see normally precise. So it's part of the uh, Kitty Chorus. Um, in, 20, in the summer of 2011, when I recorded the Kitty Chorus uh, from their, for their repertoire, she presided uh, over those recordings and she was 106 years old at the time. Quite remarkably so, uh, this recording took over four hours and there she, she was uh, on Akans 2. For those who are familiar with Akans 2, it doesn't come with a backrest. She has to sit down with a straight back, a straight face like that because it's part of the requirements for Akan leaders to project that sort of Well, it's too bad that the internet is being unstable, but yeah, here he is. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Let me go back uh, to this. So uh, we hope that, um, like I said, it's beginning to be part of the presentation. So we see how best we can do it. Um, okay. So where am I now? Now. It follows then that in the absence of the Asante Hima, who will have provided judicious advice to the Asante Hima in times of crisis, members of the chorus collectively stepped in to provide the pivotal motherly advice. Like the Asante Hima, they came to counsel, advise, caution, and warn the Asante Hima as he prepares to de deliver one of the most important decisions of his reign. Since most of them are leaders from different locations in the kingdom, they represent the voices of concerned citizens in their respective constituencies. Mm -hmm. Another crucial element that made it possible for members of the chorus to navigate formal communication protocols is the artistic immunity that comes with the power of music. As a conceptual framework, the music power lasers has been received has received comprehensive coverage, especially in popular music studies in Africa. A short list includes Thomas Turino, nationalists, cosmopolitans, and popular music in Zimbabwe, Kelly Askius, performing the nation, Swahili music and cultural politics in Tanzania, Tichi Jaji, Africa in stereo, modernism, music, and Pan African solidarity, and CRK Clark, hip hop in Africa, prophets of the city, and dusty food philosophers. The relationship between musical performance and spirituality in Asante is founded on Akan cosmology that confers artistic immunity to instrumentalists, singers, and verbal artists when performing in ceremonies and rituals. For instance, while playing grand poetry, Ayan or as part of the Phantom from Ensemble, the Odoman Kumachema, the creator's drama, and the remaining members of the ensemble cannot be sanctioned for using the Atumpan drums to castigate their superiors. It is believed that any form of surrogated speech played on drums is by divine inspiration. Dur during court ceremonies and rituals, all performances are similarly inspired by the creator. Since rulers, including the Asante Hine, are subservient to God, the creator of all things, they cannot overrule or sanction. You're muted. Thank you. So we keep trying this again. Um, yeah, we will, we will try. Yeah. 
we try and it's um uh, our attendees are so nice and kind yeah um, these days i think all that we can do is uh we are all learning to be patient and also learning to be creative exactly so, uh if you can bear with me imagine that i intentionally intentionally put this together uh with the on and off thing is also part of the presentation <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. all right so what, what okay let's see Oh, okay. Um, so I was saying that the Asante Hine, they cannot overrule or sanction artistic expressions that are imbued with his divine essence. In that case, musical performances create agency and empowerment that is accomplished by the artistic manipulation of form, rhetoric, gesture, melody, harmony, and rhythm in songs and other performance outlets. Okay. Okay. Now the performance unit. Um, all the five songs in the performance unit are instructive on several levels. As the first song unit, Akawodie, it is your turn. It's a form of motherly advice for the Asantehine to seriously reflect and choose the most qualified person to fill the big guns to. In a metaphorical sense, the second song unit, Betintia, the tall palm tree, aligns the Asantehine with a tall palm tree that either produ produces excellent tasting palm wine drink in Sapa, or in the worst case scenario, produces only froth, a group. Usually we drink the good palm wine and throw away the froth. But the froth is equally important since, since it renders a much needed service for covering the good wine and preventing it from being exposed to dust, flies, bugs, or simply unwanted ingredients in the drink. Yemo Wudin, Let Your Name Be Proclaimed, is the third song unit. It anticipates potential fallout from his choice. <coughs> Excuse me. That that not all his subjects will agree with his choice. Okay, um, not all, all um, will agree with his choice and that will potentially lead to name calling, but he should not waver in his decision. For even when his name is mentioned positively, the unspeakable implication is the potential for a reversal of all positive citations. Song number four, Osansa, the hawk, describes the agility of the black hawk that swoops down with incredible speed from the sky to capture its prey on the ground. Added to the above is the symbolic reference to the hawk as a restless and a busy bird that hops from tree to tree in search for food. A very busy leader is likened to the restlessness of the hawk who moves from uh, one situation to another, from one location to another location, taking care of affairs of the state. Yemreo, We Are Not Fed Up With You is the last song in the performance unit. It is reassuring for signifying the resolve of the women to stand by the Asantehne to the perils of their own lives. If, and that is a big if, he makes the right decision. In the interest of time, I will highlight the first song unit, Akawodir, for analysis.
the poetic text and mode of singing follow a set of performance frames. There is no instrumental accompaniment or hand claps. As a performance unit, the song is in three stanzas, lines 1 to 25, 26 to 45, and 46 to 49. I have only the first stanza in the slide. The formal framework is the archetypal call and response form that is heavily weighted on parallel repetition and subtle variations of linear units in order to amplify the message. And lastly, and no less important, is the simultaneous performance by the Asantehine when he joins the chor choral response. The call and response form is guided by three broad overarching sequences of events. That begins with the attention grabber, Ago, in line one. Uh, um, let me just run through uh, the key text and a little bit up to a certain point for you. Ago. Then the chorus will come in. In English, attention. The elders have ended their tenure of reign. It's now your turn. The elders have ended their tenure of reign. It's definitely your turn. The elders have ended their tenure of reign. It is now your turn. The elders have ended their tenure of reign. It is definitely your turn. Opokuware has ended his tenure of reign. Reign. It is your turn now. Opokuware. That's the chorus. And then Blida Sewa Nyako and on and on and on. So um, the attention grabber ago in line one is followed by eight lines of introductory narrative, lines two to nine. That flows seamlessly into a distinct prompter for the group response. The interjection and the name of a diseased king or a hema in lines 10, 14, 18, 22, and lastly, the choral response from lines 11 to 13, 15 to 17, 19 to 21, and 23 to 25. The choral response is a continuation of the call phrase. Without the interjection and repeat, it is rendered in a singular spoken key with the highlighted um, uh, conjunction. So, um, in the re regular spoken uh, language, it will be opokuware adini diako inti akawo diye. In other words, opokuware has ended his tenure of reign, and so it is now your turn. So, what I'm saying is the chorus. Um, because of this whole idea of call and response, um, in uh, my book on Enyongkro, I identify about 11 different types of call and response. So call and response is not the same. There are several different varieties of call and response. Now let's take a look at the emerging interactive form. In this formal design, the lower case J stands for the attention grabber in line one. N represents the introductory narrative, lines two to nine, followed by the call phrase itself, A, um, line 10, and the group response B, line 11 to 13, and other group responses. Without missing words, the narrative lines are emphatic and straight to the point. His forebears were confronted with similar situation, but they excelled and now it is his turn and the expectation is the same, if not higher. A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, and B3 are musical variants of A and as a result, we might be able to represent the overarching form as NAB with the understanding that the attention grabber is really not part of the song. Given the underlying goals and social relationships of the performers, audience, and the intended recipient, interactive form is attained in the present. In the present, it may result in what Kofi Agawu describes as in the moment formal impulse, commonly uh, referred to as um, improvisation. Next, um, I will analyze the rhetorical devices uh, to help us answer uh, 
my earlier question of how Nana Tutua and the members of the Kriti Chorus negotiated the complex web of formal communication protocols, including medi mediation and distancing mechanism to directly articulate the anxieties of the masses to that Santegmi. Nana Tutua begins the, okay. Nana Tutua begins the performance unit by deploying a conventional access DNA mechanism in Akan, the spoken word, Ago, attention please, in order to mitigate interactional routines and communication strategies and immediately draws attention to her that she is about to make a statement or in this case, perform a song. Armed with artistic immunity, she faced the Asantehne uh, direct and then proceeds with nine lines of narrative to present the petition by deploying interje interjections. A as the beginning phrase in line two and yay in line six and raising her voice and prolonging the particle E in lines two and six and thus placing unmistakable weight on the multi-syllabic multi phrase in penning for. It may well be that all the interjections in the core phrases are artistically motivated on the part of the lead singer and by no means an accident. As non lexical texts, they are used as pickups, a form of anacrusis that lead up to the main phrase in paying for. By processes of parallel repetition of linear units, in paying for is projected as a formulaic phrase that appears four times in each stanza, three times in the narrative and one during the call and response. Additionally, in penning for as a formulaic phrase is used as a signal in line 22 for the group that the stanza is coming to an end or they are about to end the song unit. The chorus then performs line 23 to 25 as a closing gesture. Additional words about the formulaic phrase in penning for is in order. The literal translation of in penning for in English is eldest, but in this context, Elders refer to diseased male and female forebears of the Asantehine. One of the re re rhetorical devices that lend credibility to the performed petition is references to forebears or the genealogy of Asante kings and Ahima. Nana Tutua begins with a general reference to the elders. In case we are in doubt as to who the elders are, she embarks on what Kwesi Yanka refers to as referential poetry, mentioning specific names of the 15th Asantehine, Opukuware II, who reigned from 1970 to 1999, in line 10, and the 12th Asantehima, Nana Amasewa Nyakun II, who also reigned from 1945 to 1977, in line 14, and the 14th Asantehine, Osei Ajiman Prempe II, who also reigned from 1931 to 1970, in line 18. The choral response affirms the names in lines 12, 16, and 20. All the names are preceded by the interjection, yay, and thus placing emphasis on the names. A word about repetition. Each stanza begins with repetition of linear units with sequ sequential buildup in the late part from lines two to 10. The repetitive choral responses are composed to reinforce two critical issues in the petition, namely strategic reference to the elders and it is your turn. Telescoping collective and contrapuntal voices, each stanza is rounded off with three lines of chorus phrases. That is a repetition of parts of the lead phrases. Repetition of linear units in all three stanzas are imbued with subtle variation in both the lead and chorus phrases. For instance, Linear repetition and subtle variation of end phrases in the lead pass are defined by the syllable dear, as in this case, dear, and yet dear unko, yen dear ko. As a formulaic phrase, dear in lines two and four uh, means dears, while the same lines in three and four means yours. Another formulaic phrase is dear o, um, Dear O, 
and would the uncle would the uncle okay um as a formulaic phrase there in lines two and four oh sorry another okay here sorry about that this time around there has the same meaning yours while the former is extended with a particle the latter uses an adjective alone which is a contraction of meaning the mantle falls on you alone since the two distinct phrases immediately follow the weighted phrase in and in four in lines two and four in the late past and the referential names in the group response we can reckon their placement in those particular moments by Nana Tutua and members of the chorus is driven by the need for emphasis. Gesture and rhetoric. The interface between hand gestures, body movements, and musical performance is one of the most impoverished areas in African musicology and ethnomusicology in general. Um, here are two books for starters, uh, Musical Gestures, Sound Movement and Meaning, edit, edited by Rolf uh, Godoy and Mark Lehman. And then uh, a second book, for instance, Anthony Gritton and Elaine King, uh, who edited New Perspectives on Music and Gesture. The verbally constructed performance is reinforced by nonverbal gestures, such as body and hand gestures, the gait and demeanor of performance, eye contacts, smiles, or frowns. Nonverbal gestures are as important as rhetorical advices and the message, but that is not all, for there are concurrent gestures um, by the ascending here. Hand gestures are coordinated with the same formulaic phrases that I previously identified and thus adding another layer of prominence and urgency to the already weighted words in pain for would you would when singing the lead pass nana tutua raises her right hand with her palm open on in pain for but she waves her hand and points her index finger direct towards the king um on the two end phrases would you and would you Continuing the lead, the, the lead line, and since lines 11 and 13 includes the end from lake phrases, members of the chorus collectively point their index fingers towards the Asantehine. Pointing and waving the index fingers signifies warning or, on the lighter side, caution. Members of the chorus are drawing the Asantehine's attention to the potential threat to peace and normal life should his choice turn out to be below expectations. On his part, the Asante nods his head for the duration of the call phrase from lines two to 10. He joins the choral response to the concluding phrase in each stanza. Remarkably, he folds his right hand fingers and hits his chest with singing. Oh, sorry, why singing? Although we cannot hear his voice, his lip movement indicates his singing a dif uh, different defining phrase. When the chorus sings, Aka Udio, it is your turn. Concurrently, he sings, Aka Medio, it is my turn. So this is going on concurrent, con concurrently. Um, Another, um, there are notable, sorry, there are not, 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 notable gestures throughout the performance unit. And in another uh, reciprocal gesture, at the end of the performance unit, the Asante Hine expressed his gratitude to the performers by shaking the hands of each and every member of the chorus. In the words of Ajikun, reciprocal gesture of a higher status, status person, in this case, the Asante Hine, shaking the hands of members of the KT chorus, after receiving a performed petition from the masses, creates harmony and peaceful uh, coexistence. The nonverbal handshaking foster social relationships and solidarity between the Asante Hine and the women, and by extension, the larger community that the women represent. 
a word about acceptable hand gestures in front gestures in front of adults and especially in a formal setting involving the Asante Hine is in order. Among the Akan, it is not acceptable for a child to point his or her index finger toward an adult. It is totally unheard of. It is simply an abomination that will certainly cause an outrage. Conversely, adults or those in authority are able to point index fingers to a child or those below them in authority. It is expected and seen as having serious consequences, but it is only matters of great, grave concern that will cause an adult or those in authority to resort to pointing index fingers in order to admonish a bad behavior or wrongdoing of a younger person. It is also un unimaginable that subjects could do the same to their superiors, not to talk of their santehine in formal or informal situations. With that being the case, why was it possible for members of the Kete Chorus to point these abominable hand gestures towards the Asantehine? The answer is simple. It is acceptable for parents, or in this case, mothers, to counsel, caution, or warn their children, even if that child happens to be the king. I would like to bypass the usual beautiful summary and conclusion and proceed swiftly to a short postscript to end the presentation. On February 6, 2017, the Asante finally appointed his 83-year-old sister, Nana Amakunadu, as the new Asante Hima. Three months later, on May 9, 2017, she was formally presented to Asante Man as part of a dedication ceremony of a park in memory of the late Asante Hima. Her school name is Nana Kunadu Yadon III. That means the choice of a successor went to the oldest female in the matri line, and that sets the stage for a new era for Asante Man in particular and Ghana in general. A new successor ensures continuity of the matri, matri line and orderly transfer of power. And while we have not seen any group contesting her appointment, the potential for chaos and violence is not in the horizon. But lest we forget that all interactive formal structures and rhetorical devices in the first song unit, it is your turn, establish a global regime for collective action that creates the capacity for agency and empowerment for the female members of the matrilineage for the continuity of a sentiment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Koesi. That was wonderful, beautiful. I loved the song. Thank you so much. The internet tried to play tricks, but we are we were here. <laughs> Managed. We managed, yes, very good. So now it's time for questions. Please write your questions on the Q&A and my colleague, Isaac, Dr. Isaac Palumbu will read them. I just like while people are writing their questions, uh, I was thinking about how, is it, you, is it always the same way or it depends? Are there changes on how the, the performance is done depending on the king or, I, I was just wondering. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, there was somewhere there that I, I did mention that um, yes, um, in oral cultures also, there's pre-performance composition. The composition has been performed already. It is not written on paper. It's, it's in the heads of the performance, but um, it is the exegesis of the performance situation that determines. So I did mention that uh, the form came about in this particular form that I've shared with you, the overarching NAB and all those people shouldn't take it as fixed in stone because in a different context, in another day, depending on the situation, uh, the form might change depending on the intended message, you know, who is receiving 
who you know the the nature of the so it's not always going to be the same and that is what makes um performances in oral cultures so unique in the sense that and that's why some people refer to what they call living tradition you know it's it's, it's a living tradition because uh, the meaning and everything comes up in the context of what is going on so it's not something that is fixed already and it's not changeable it is changeable uh depending on the situation very good mm -hmm. okay um while others are still thinking of their questions um i'll take this opportunity to ask a question question um you know you you, you raise the issue of the importance of music as a tool used to give agency to groups of people who otherwise may be considered as not having power. Yeah. Um, and as an ethnomusicologist, I readily agree with that because I've seen several examples of that. Uh, but also as an ethnomusicologist, I have often wondered whether there are other avenues through which this privilege is afforded to people that do not have power. Do people that do not have power have other ways of expressing dissent or opinions or uh, preferences to those in power outside music, outside dance, outside these performative um, uh, traditions? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Isaac. Um, uh, you know, and also I agree with you definitely. Of course, there are several avenues that people use, you know, to contest power, to mediate power, to negotiate power. There are several avenues. But of course, because um, sometimes we don't think about the power of music. Sometimes um, in, in some other places, they don't think about that. That's why uh, when I, and of course my area is music. My focus is always in music when I'm aware. I mean, people can, protest, people are protesting on the streets right now as we speak in America, right? And they are not, it's not, they are not using music and all those things. So um, there are all kinds of avenues, but because my area is music and I want to project that, there are ways where music can, uh, does that context, music uh, gives agency and empowerment and all that. So that's why I used music. Um, and, and, and also this whole idea of present a petition through a song, using a song or using a musical performance to present petition is uncommon. It's something that in other places where music is not integral to their society and music is secondary or whatever, third or whatever you can name it, where music is entertainment, right? Okay, right. So, so to the extent that you, you saw that when they were performing the petition, the, the, the king was also singing with them. The king didn't just sit down and just watch them passively, right? Because it's a cultural expectation that when they are performing the petition, uh, he, uh, or in Akan itself, the king, uh, as patron of the ass, should know the ass by his participation. So anytime there's a performance, he if he doesn't take part, then they might think he did not even receive it. Right. So, so I'm right. showing all kinds of dynamics that are not found elsewhere in yes. other societies in the world, where you will find it in all kinds of places in Africa. And I use that Asante as an example. Thank you very much, uh, Kwesi. Very fascinating. I have a question here from Dr. Jamie Monson. And she says, I appreciated the emphasis on gesture and performance, as well as the analysis of the words and drum styles. How are these elements passed on from one generation to another? Is there any space for improvisation? Wow. Okay, thank you, Dr. Monson. <laughs> okay, so how many questions in that? <laughs> okay. Um, um, oh, after you finish this. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Um, see, um, excuse me, um, 
one of the most unique aspects of oral traditions. And sometimes we tend to think, oh, the youth, the young, the young people are not into their culture and all those things. And people get, you know, nervous and all that. I, I never, you know, think about it in a second. Because in these cultures, uh, it's always passed on all the time. You know, so for instance, when I told you that the last time a situation like this happened was 209 years ago in 1809, you know, as at 2017, you know, so how did they know all these things? So um, this musical, and yes, I know the challenges of modern gadgets, including the internet and all those things, but um, these women, as they perform and all those things, there are also, don't forget that in the matrilineage, uh, people have access to these songs. They perform uh, when the situation arises and there are people in the, the households who are learning these songs, who can even sing, and, but maybe they won't be allowed to perform right now until they assume a leadership role and they have to be a member of this and then they sing. Let me, let me tell you, let me give you a typical example. 2011, August, when I went to record this group, um, the, 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 the lead singer was called Ketehima. Um, when I came back by December, I got a phone call. She, has part, she had passed away. And they were asking me to send them a video clip of what I recorded and some pictures so they can use that in the lesson. Well, what, so I knew the leader before this incident, before 2017. So think of 2011, 2017, how many years difference? When I went to this ceremony, I didn't know they were going to show up. So I always go, when I'm in the palace and anything's going on, I tend to document, I tend to record. And then all of a sudden, I saw a different person leading the songs. So this person who was leading the songs wasn't the same person who led the songs in 2011 for me. She's now stepped in. And I asked them because when I recorded in 2011, there were a whole, all kinds of narratives, you know, stories, storytelling that they did with songs and all that, uh, that I, I've included in my current book, uh, uh, the uh, Asante Court Music that came up, just came out, right? They didn't do that here. So I asked uh, them, how is this new person going to remember all that narrative? <laughs> you know, they laughed. They said, she will. Um, and if it comes to a serious situation where they expect her and they have to perform certain rituals and all, she will be filled with the spirit of knowing all the, uh, the narrative. Th that wasn't the first time that I've been told that. There was a situation when I was also documenting dramas and I asked them when the Ochrema, the creator's drama passed away, how is this next person going to know all this Huge knowledge base. As usual, they laughed and they said, he knows quite a bit, but if there's a lot missing, they'll perform certain rituals. Um, I know I'm missing another part of the question, the last part, right? What was it? Um, if you can go quick on it, it just says, who are the members of the audience? Are they the whole public or a selected audience? Oh, okay, okay. So it depends. This was a this was a, a something like a private event. This was inside, deep inside the palace, where uh, people are not allowed to. But just because we've had four days of public event that over close to fifty thousand people event for the passing. So on this particular day, the, the few days afterwards, people were exhausted. So they they as the, the, the king didn't want to stage another huge thing he wanted people to raise. So he did a small event in the palace. In that location, a lot of people are not allowed to go there. So that was why it was a small gathering. Yes. So uh, another question here is coming in from Portia Ousu. Hmm. And she says, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. It was like a beautiful performance with appropriate poses. <laughs> <laughs> My question is about the female agency and how it is negotiated in Akan institutions. You mentioned that it is the queen mother who 
who advises the king on choosing occupant of the stool, but ultimately the decision belongs to the king. In what specific ways do females enforce their power in situations where they vehemently disagree, for example? Oh, okay. Let me uh, thank you. Um, let me let me correct it. Um, um, there are two scenarios. When the king passes on, remember I said that Asante Hima, who, which in the English has been wrongly labeled queen, and I intentionally did not use the word queen because that, the European word queen doesn't really describe who the Asante Hima is. So I said when the king passes on, it is the role of the queen without consultation with, with any man who nominates a, a male member of the matri lineage to occupy the males too. So the queen nominates, but when the queen passes on, it is the king who appoints a female member from the matri lineage also. So I didn't say that the queen will appoint a king but then the king have a, a, a say in that because by that time, the king is passed on. There will be no queen. When the, the king, a king passes on, the queen mother assumes control of the stool. So by nominating somebody, the queen symbolically hands over now the ancestral stool to that male chief. Yeah, we are humans and there will always be uh, disagreements most times, um, yes, there will always be disagreements in, in terms of all that. That's why I gave some scenarios. I said, the queen is the last resort of counseling the king. If there are all kinds of misunderstanding in the society, the king is misbehaving. People are saying, stop, the, the, the king is not listening. The people will channel their grievances to the queen mother. And so the Asante Ma, who will find a way to talk to the the Asante in the king. Mm -hmm. If so, that's why I say counsel, caution, and even warn. And his her warning is always going to be taken serious because she is also the one person who can dethrone a, a chief, a king. Thank you, Kwesi. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tomia asks a question that is similar to the one that Doctor Manson asked. Uh, and it's about how um, singing women um, are prepared for future roles. Um, and and um, clearly the traditions are being passed on the way you describe both in terms of the drummers and the singers. And it, it's a culture that is alive and is going on. Um, I wanted to just extend that question to ask whether there is any need for the formal education system to be part of this or does that open up a can of worms or uh, how, where does the formal music training in a Khan society, um, say in the education system, uh, uh, elementary school, high school, uh, that does, is, is this kind of training uh, possible in that, in that environment, or it's not at all necessary? Hmm. Thank you, Isaac. This is a, uh, a loaded question. Um, let, me, let me start by saying, sadly, the colonial education system, you know, has failed Africa in all kinds of ways. Over 60 years of independence, Africans are still uh, hooked onto the colonial education system you know, because during the colonial time, in order for Europeans to colonize Africa, they have to destroy institutions. They have to destroy institutions and they destroyed institutions and planted this half-baked education that they are offering to all of us. And after independence, I'm sad to say that the curriculum is still geared towards European, you know, so a form of education which doesn't help. Africans. These are the days of decolonizing the discourse. That is why I, if you watch me, 
I use certain uh, coded uh, words in my presentation without even bothering to define. Throughout the literature, everybody says queen mother, queen mother. I try to avoid that in my presentation, like I said. And then there's the word golden stool, golden stool. I avoided that without even explain, explaining why I didn't, and I use the word goes to. I have my reasons for doing that, which I won't go there right now. But talk of education system. So there are, you know, Ghana, we were lucky in a way, unlike several places in Africa, to by the time of the end of the colonial rule, to have been able to re re redeem some of our traditional institutions that were totally destroyed, decimated by violence colonial uh, Europeans, right? So um, there's a traditional knowledge base and the so-called uh, formal education. Most of these women who performed may not have the formal education that you and I have. And in, sadly to say in our societies, we refer to these people as illiterates, right? And I have never seen anybody in the world who is illiterate, who creates poetry, who creates arts, you know, who, illiterates who create arts, artistic, enduring artistic monuments or whatever. And we, the little European education, how big that we have, we refer to them as illiterates, right? So the education system is not hooked onto this. Mm. You know, Sadly, the Akan people, for instance, have a calendar, 42 days calendar, and every day of the, uh, every day is named for a whole year. Ask me, where is the calendar in our national politics? They threw away the Akan calendar, and now we are using this European calendar that doesn't have any thing to do for us, right? But the traditional people still follow their account calendar. So in order to end this long, uh, this in, let me tell you this, the traditional people, they say there's knowledge and also there's wisdom. Mm -hmm. So sometimes for somebody like me, working with them, if I don't express myself in certain ways, they'll look at me and say, oh, yes, you are a professor but you only have knowledge, you don't have wisdom. Mm. Mm. So when I go to them, I go to them humbly. I yeah. don't go there with my European half big education or professor. Well, th this is a very big topic as you, as you mentioned at the beginning, Kwesi, um, yeah. and it's going to be an enduring question uh, from now on because people are really now focusing on the whole issue of um, decolonizing the whole uh, education system in Africa and also the idea that, you know, we, we need to revisit what we term knowledge and what we term non-knowledge. Um, and so uh, this is going to be an enduring question. There's a question here that I think everybody would like to hear an answer for. Um, it comes from Anne Lutomia and she asks, um, thank you for your presentation. I was pleased to see that you could sing along I would like to know what motivated you to pursue this research. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I hope you didn't take my singing seriously. <laughs> 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 thank you. Um, no, um, so the motivation, first of all, come from me going to school, going to music school, going to school in Ghana, all the way till I went to the university. And as a music major, I was taught everything about European music, European classical system and everything. Um, the little uh, knowledge or time that we have for my Ghanaian, African, Akan was the uh, few research that Professor Nketia has done for us, right? N no one was bringing all those things. So there will be a time I was growing up in Ghana, on TV, on Ghana TV service, every Sunday, they said, hours with the masters. And then they play European music. And I kept asking myself, what about us? 
don't because I grew up in the villages. I didn't grow up in the city. You know, I'm a hundred percent village boy, right? I grew up in the villages, and I had all these amazing music and performances going on. And I look at the books, and I didn't have anything to read about the people in the villages that I grew up with. So I said, okay. Uh, when I came to the United States, my master's, because of my music background at the University of Ghana, my master's was in Western music theory. It still did not allow me to engage in mine. So once I finished master's in Western music theory, I asked them here in the United States, I said, what can I do what, uh, to bring in the music from my village also? They said, then you have to study ethnomusicology. I said, okay, thank you. Ethnomusicology, here I come. <laughs> so... <laughs> that is what I did, and that is why I decided for a lifelong uh, engagement to go and bring research from my villages and all kinds of places uh, to represent my village and the people and their knowledge around the world. So that next time when they talk of hours with the masters, they'll bring people, amazing musicians and composers like this woman and all kinds of people on the TV in the hours of the masses, you know, from colonial Ghana, won't be just the music of, uh, it's not like I don't like music of Beethoven and all those things, but I don't think that is good for a nation. A nation must have the identity. So that's why I did that. And if you are interested, um, just Google me and you see all kinds of publications and you can check them out. Thank you so much, uh, Kwesi. That was our last question. Awa? Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Kwesi, so very much. It was wonderful having you here. Uh, thank you, thank you. And thank you, everybody else who attended this talk. Uh, thank you for your time, and please join us next time, same time, Thursday, 12 p.m. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.